What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the third edition of the Opening Tea Podcast. Thanks for coming back and joining me for another week. As uh, I start this week, I, I guess a little bittersweet, a little tilted, a little excited. I guess maybe a, a little bit of, of everything as two of my favorite players, uh, Kevin Na and Patrick Cantlay, uh, went into a playoff, which of course was, was great to see them go into a playoff, but We'll start off with our foursome of facts from last week, since that is our first topic. And I just mentioned Kevin Na and Patrick Cantley went into the playoff and really showing that past champions are thriving at this event. Don't know why. Don't know if it's just a, a great course fit or whatever have you, but we got Kevin Na, who's now a two-time winner. We've got Patrick Cantley, who is a win and two runner-ups in his three starts here. And then Bryson DeChambeau, who in his four starts... Has three top ten, uh, four top tens, I think, actually now. So, uh, including a win and a fourth place here this year. So, very, very interesting. Um, also, the second playoff in three of uh, fall events. But prior to that, it had been quite some time since we had a playoff. So, interesting to see that as well. Um, I mentioned uh, no. I, do, I mentioned I was a little upset off the top uh, of the match. And this is not really a foursome facts of the week. I'm just going to give this like a little bulleted point here. I had four second place finishes across DFS sites last week, and the reason why I'm really actually bitter, bittersweet is on the FanDuel, I decided to make 300 lineups this week, and you know, 150 in the three dollar and 150 in the nine dollar, and used Excel obviously after using Fantasy Cruncher to, to put my lineups in and use that awesome ran function and just you know mixed up the lineups, and sure enough, my two best lineups were put in the three dollar. And had one of those lineups been put in the nine dollar, not even two, not even both, just one of them, I would have uh, won it. So, a little bittersweet, but happy to have the, the four second place finishes. However, searching for second place finishes, or how about any top tens, which is our second for some facts of the week, the Corn Ferry grads, none out of the fifty. No, I don't think all fifty played last week. I definitely didn't. Um, none of them came in the top ten last week. Only Denny McCarthy, who obviously was retaining his. His card uh, from last year, so he wasn't a corn fairy grad. He was corn fairy grad last year. None in the top ten. So really interesting to see that. Uh, of course, as I just mentioned, past champions are starting to thrive. So maybe just knowing the places to miss and knowing the breaks uh, helps at TPC Summerlin, which was you know certainly a scoring fest last week. Had a guy really late and a guy that I covered quite a bit last week, Christopher Ventura. He doubled 17. He was sitting in a T9. He doubled 17 uh, to take him out of the top 10. However, if he went par par there, I think he would have been in it. So he was the closest. My uh, uh, third fact of the week, Pat Perez is your top five out of nowhere. And this guy, 6,300 last week. I mean, totally crazy. Now, if we go back to our handy-dandy OWGR rankings of that, Pat Perez was one of the top yet again in that price category of below 7,000. So again, just that measure uh, coming into play yet again. We saw it come into play last week with Adam Hadwin, uh, and we see it now again here with Patrick Perez. So something to take note of. Uh, again, it's not the best barometer of, of using and, and trying to um, pin players down, but again, it's, it's certainly something to, to take a look at. Um, actually, Pat Perez had, uh, has struggled a little bit, so he's tanked down a little bit. Still, again, more out of nowhere than anything else. Uh, ranked 183rd in the world. Just came out of nowhere. Hasn't really played that great um, at this course either, so it's not like we could have gone on course history. Um, and then uh, we'll go on to our last one here. And this is a, certainly a big time developing theme in DFS. And it's the six of six percentage. Now, granted it's the fall swing and maybe there's a little bit more uh, variability to the uh, event and to the field. But this is now the fourth straight event where we've gotten under 5% six of six. And it's, and it's really turning into an approach where you can almost try and punt one position in these smaller contests, and we'll talk about this uh, in a new segment I'm going to bring up here in, in just about a couple of minutes. Um, but very interesting. Five of six was only about 20%, so very, very hard to get that six of six, especially with that no cut. 
However, the no cut didn't, uh, the, the new cut, not the no cut, I'm sorry, the new cut rule. Uh, and the new cut rule didn't come into play this week, but still plenty of chalky golfers missed. So uh, those are the foursome facts of the week. Hopefully uh, you've gleaned something off of last week uh, based off of that. Again, uh, this was at the Shriners at TPC Summerlin. Um, no Corn Ferry guys uh, in the top 10, so certainly something to look forward to. However, it's not going to happen this week. But before we move on to this week, last week we brought up a segment, the Not Your Average Cut, Not Your Average Missed Cut segment, and it's it's caught a little fire. I really like it. Uh, it seems like it, it's a good way for people to take a look at some guys that uh, you know may or should have made the cut and could be a good force to be reckoned with uh, this week. Uh, last week we mentioned seven golfers. Five made the cut, so not bad. You know, five bounce back weeks. We had a top ten in there with Joel Damon. A uh, couple of other, um, couple of other good finishes in there as well. So uh, certainly something to take a look at. And this week we're going to start off with Kramer Hickok. Woof! Shot one under for the two days, but lost over six strokes putting. So you know, if he had just matched the field, that would have put him somewhere at like seven under, which would have been. You know, right in the middle of the pack heading into the weekend. Um, Ryan Armour was very close to him as well. Uh, then Scott Piercy, man, just so incredibly disappointing. Uh, playing in his hometown, he missed the cut because of his putting. Bud Cauley and Emiliano Grillo are our two wooden Chinoets. Um, no surprises to see these guys have putting uh, be their downfall. Then a couple of other guys that are definitely a little bit interesting to me this week, Andrew Landry and C.T. Pan, um, as well as Nick Watney. And then Dylan Fratelli and Brandon Hagee round out the guys that strictly missed the cut due to their putting. Again, they're not your average missed cut segment. It's really guys that, if they just match the field in their putting, would have made the cut. So I like to talk about that a little bit. As I mentioned before last week, we see that punting can flip on a dime, and if these guys are playing uh, part of their other games, uh, playing well, then certainly something to take a look at. And like I said, Joel Damon uh, was one of the ones that we mentioned right off the top last week as a as a good value for this week, and a guy that uh, only missed the putt due to his putting the previous one. So definitely uh, a couple of names on that list with CT Pan kind of heading it off. Let me just make sure that um, I'm not telling you that. You know, I'm just going to make sure C.T. Pan is in the field here this week because he may not be. It is a very, very, very weak field. Um, plus, he's probably heading over uh, to play in the tournaments in Asia. So I actually wouldn't be surprised if he is not in the field this week as I pulled my field list. Let's see here. One second. Yeah, no surprise. Uh, he is not in the field this week. So... Um, Maybe for him when he heads over to Asia, certainly somebody to take a look at. That ball striking might look to be coming around, um, but the putting was uh, lagging. So flip side of that, just a couple of golfers that are putting very well. Uh, and second week in a row that Peter Malnati just cannot find the irons. And he went through a stretch last year where he was just absolutely fantastic with his irons. So something to take a note out there that maybe Peter uh, can find his irons. Um this week or the next time he plays a couple of other names Rob Pampling on Raban Lahiri Sebastian Munoz and Austin Cook all played very well uh, I'm sorry not played putted putted very well but did nothing else well enough uh, so they all missed the cut uh, Melnati of course is in the field this week I believe Lahiri is as well so maybe something to take a look at there now, uh, the last segment before we give our little 10-15 minute preview of this week as we're at just about 10 minutes now, as you know on the opening tee podcast, also from Shot 3 from the tee podcast, I'd like to keep these to about 25 minutes, hopefully for consumption time, just a little bit easier to break into the week. So, this new segment that I'm going to call the Spotlight DFS Contest, the reason why I'm putting it in is because I had a lot of people, one of the main questions is, you know, I've got X dollars to spend on PGA DFS per week. Where should I be investing my money? Well, it's hard for me to give you a perfect answer or give anyone a perfect answer there. It's all about what the goals are. What are your goals? Are your goals to go for the lottery ticket and, and play to win? Or is it to grind out and try and build a bankroll? Two very different questions. Of course, that if you're just looking for the lottery ticket and you hit it, of course, that builds the bankroll, right? But if you're also looking to test your skills and grind, um, 
you should be looking at contests. So just for an example here, the $555 signature hole and the $8 big contest last week, you needed over 500 points to cash in, in either of those contests. The $44 club twirl, which is the third biggest contest of the week, same exact thing. The fourth biggest contest of the week, which by my calculation was the $3 60K birdie, that actually had 492, so a little bit lower. Still, all pretty big scores. The $100 stinger, which was uh, another big one there, 494. However, um, I picked just this one um, because it, it was it was easiest to see. There's only 25 people in it. Take any price point you want to put at 25 people, but I picked the $333 single entry, and the cash line there was 424 points. So we're talking about 70 less points. Sure, there's not as much money to be won in that single entry $333, but you know, you cash in that, it's $700 back to the bankroll. For me, I think I came in in second this week, uh, one of my four second place finishes, you know, and that pays for now a couple of more signature holes, helping to build that bankroll up. Now again, signature hole, it was a lot harder to cash this week. Then we can even go another step further and take the $50 double up this week. Your cash line was 427 there. So, you know, if, if you're a little bit too nervous to go up to the $150 or $300, you know, 25 manners, that fifty dollar double up also, which had over a hundred people in it, four hundred and twenty seven points. So that's a big time difference from trying to cash in even the three dollar or the eight dollar or the forty four dollar or the five hundred dollar versus the fifty dollar double up. So people always say, you know, where should I invest my money if I'm trying to build my bankroll? Well, the first thing I would tell you to do is you don't necessarily have to build a cash team or a GPP team. You just build your best team and you put it in that $50 double up or the $5 double up, which you needed 440 points to cash in this week. So still more than 60 points less to cash than you would need to cash in some of these big GPPs. Once you build that bankroll up, sure. Now, can you make three lineups, four lineups and, and put it in, in, in these guaranteed player pools? Absolutely. But that's just one question that I get a lot that I think is really important to take note that, yeah, if you're putting in 10 entries into this $3, you know, and your, let's say your main line, which you're building your lineups off of, you know, scores 440 points, it's likely that of those 10 entries, you're going to get two, maybe three into the cash line. So just because you're doing 10 entries doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to help you out. It's all about building that bankroll and being able to throw in 10 entries into these bigger ones or even more, of course, depending on your bankroll and uh, be able to test your skills in these 50-50s. If you can't beat 50% of the field, you're not going to be able to beat 80% of the field. That's what I've, I've been trying to tell people. And it's a good way to see. You know, I wouldn't build, people ask me, do you build different types of lineups? In this instance, no, I'm going to build my best lineup and I'm going to put it in the cash line and I'm going to put it in the $2,100 or the $500. That's just, that's the way I play. I don't try and differentiate too much between my lineups. However, uh, I will say that I tend to build more balanced lineups in my higher dollar stuff, which would be considered cash if we were going by, by that barometer. So just wanted to bring that up, the differential in number of points you need to score to win money. It's pretty significant. I'll just give the, the last three. The $20 scramble, which is a three entry max, was 486 this week, um, but you didn't really get too much of a, a break there. The 12 In the $12 single entry, some good competition there this week, 506 was the, the cash line. The $33 single entry, not much break there either. 496 was the cash line. So even if you go to single entries, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna get a lower cash line. We saw this week, there wasn't too much differential between the GPPs at all, whether it was single entry or 150 entry. You saw the differential when you went into the 50-50s, of course. All right, now let's transition into the Houston Open. We're at 14 minutes, so probably gonna give it 10, 15 minutes on, on this. Uh, it is the ugliest and worst field of the year. We'll get into that in just a bit. That's actually the next portion of, of what we talk about. 
So first, the Houston Open uh, played at the Golf Club of Houston. I've actually played it before uh, myself. Um, pretty good golf course. Uh, the last two, three holes are very, very difficult, especially with the wind. Um, it's a par 72 measuring 7,400 yards, 13 on the stint meter, so very fast. Uh, putting it is speaking of putting it's on bent pole which is not a surprise when you see how fast it is um, so coming in same exact one as last week some rye grass for the rough in the fairway which is a, a little bit different um, than maybe what these guys have seen the course has fluctuated from one of the easiest to uh, the middle of the pack in terms of toughness on the PGA Tour uh, which is interesting you know a, a couple of times because it wasn't in back-to-back -back succession years either. It was in 2016 where it was, you know, ranked 42nd easiest. And then again in 2018 when it was last played, uh, it was also ranked in the top 10. Well, the other two years of, of the four were ranked in the 20s. So probably just when they catch it with wind. And, of course, we know how much that can play uh, into things. So I just mentioned that it, it really quickly. I don't know if you caught it. The, this is the first time the tournament is back. It, it took a year off, got in got booted out with that new schedule change. Now it gets uh, to be a fall event this year, which is likely where it's going to stay, um, especially that it's not attracting really anybody. And I mentioned right off the top when we talked about the Houston Open, this is the ugliest field of the year. No doubt about it. It's a, first of all, it's a, it's a swing season event, so not many top golfers are playing anyway, one. And two, the tour is heading to Asia after this week for three weeks. So it's likely that a lot of the top players that you would think to play, for example, maybe even like Jordan Spieth, who has really good success on this golf course, um, are heading over to Asia this week uh, to get acclimated to that uh, time change that, that we're going to have uh, to deal with. So not really too much of a surprise. Henrik Stenson is um, the name that is probably going to ring a lot of bells uh, in terms of OWGR. He is the lowest, followed by Keegan Bradley, Lucas Beauregard, Tom Lewis, Jason Kokrak, and Russell Knox. Wow, yikes. Those are the top six golfers in terms of OWGR. Now, in terms of prices this week, because we have such a weak field, I don't expect, and DraftKings hasn't posted contests yet, which makes me believe that we're not going to get a 50K to first on the $8. I'm going to guess we're going to get like 30K to first. Uh, if my memory serves me correctly for this type of event, we'll see. That may be a little bit bigger. Um, the pricing is going to be interesting. I believe that they'll go right to Henrik, who I just mentioned. I think they're going to put him at 11.3. We've seen uh, Brooks and JT go up to 11.8, but I doubt they're going to throw Stenson up, up there this week. I just think that he's not quite shown, plus he hasn't played yet in the fall. I don't think they're going to give him 11.8. They're going to give him the Patrick Cantley type price this week, which may not be a bad uh, bad price for him. Pretty good course history here. He's gotten in the top five at least once, maybe twice in the last couple of years. So um, last couple of uh, tournaments, I should say here. 11.3 for Henrik. I got Scotty Scheffler at 10.7. I know he had a terrible Sunday. Looked like he totally mailed it in over the weekend entirely when he was, you know, millions of shots back after uh, really going into the weekend. It was a bad start to his Saturday round, actually. He was 700 going into the weekend and just terrible, terrible start. But he was so highly owned at 8.8K, and he's likely going to be one of the top five guys on the odds board. I say DK puts him at 10.7 this week, followed by Jason Kokrak, 10.4. Brian Harmon was very, very popular last week at 7.8, so he likely gets the jump up to 10.2K this week. And I think they end up sliding Keegan Bradley in at 10,000. He's got some pretty good course history, plus he's the second OWGR in the field right behind Stenson. So I think they moved uh, Keegan Bradley up to 10. So Henrik 11.3, Scotty 10.7, Jason Kokrak 10.4, Harmon 10.2, and Keegan Bradley at 10,000. That rounds out the top five of my guessing on prices this week, or at least the guys that I believe will be above 10K. Maybe a couple of, uh, at least a, a couple of guys uh, within shouting distance. You know, Russell Henley was um, not too popular this week, but a past champion. He'll likely be in the nines. If Cameron Champ plays this week, he'll definitely be in the nines. But my guess is that he's not going to play with his, his grandfather basically on his deathbed and was very emotional this week playing. 
My guess is he sits this one out and we see him withdraw. I could be totally wrong, of course, um, but that's just my guess. Um, then um, maybe one other one getting an honorable mention here is Luke List is coming off a big-time finish um, here when it was last played, plus found form over the weekend. He's not, he's not going to be above 10K, just kind of a, a name that I'm throwing out there. Um, which is a good transition into the statistical focus because this is the stat that actually Luke List led in uh, in this tournament when it was played here in 2018. And while 200 plus was not a factor in the last couple, uh, I'm sorry, last week, because there just wasn't that many shots, the course was playing so, um, so fast. And I think, you know, the most that somebody had outside of 200 yards when you take away the par fives, um, maybe one approach or two approaches per day. So 200 plus didn't matter last week. However, with 7,400 yards this week, it's definitely going to matter. It was the average most. It was 16 was the most and eight was the least uh, amount of shots taken from outside of 200 last year from the, uh, I'm sorry, two years ago from the golfer. So we do a total one, uh, total 180 where 200 didn't matter last week. 200 plus proximity matters a lot this week. Um, around the green, However, it does not seem to matter that much. None of the winners gained even a stroke for the entire uh, tournament in that statistic. So um, also note on that, uh, on the statistical note, only Russell Henry gained more than four strokes in the last four winners here off the tee. So really a second shot golf course. Uh, strokes gained approach. All of the winners gained at least four strokes over the last couple of years. Um, and of course, putting as well. And if you can punt on bent uh definitely have a little bit of a leg up however i feel like because of the field strength we may not have so uh, too much data on the actual golfers playing uh in this field again really weak field this week uh only two golfers ranked in the top 50 in the world here as the tour transitions out to asia so no surprise to see this one maybe go uh this pod maybe go a little bit short we're at just about 23 minutes uh, but i will be back tomorrow evening and we will discuss some of this stuff probably the tons of field changes that we're going to have certainly want to talk about the monday qualifiers uh, again as we had a couple make the cut last week um, actually two of the guys that we focused both made the cut and both would have uh, provided some value in these smaller contests had you had rostered them because they would have given you great salary flexibility as well. So you won't want to uh, miss that. And of course, uh, got our normal set of content out. Uh, if you haven't already seen the first cut, which is um, a lot of this stuff and uh, more, uh, go ahead and, and check that out. I'm sure once you hear this, uh, it'll be out as well. Unless you're listening on Sunday night, which maybe it won't be out then. Um, and then, of course, our full slate of content from Ben and I, and then our Wednesday night show uh, that we'll have, and of course, the Tuesday show with Ben and Tim. Uh, and then next week, we, our Ben and my show is called Live Before Lock, and it really will be starting next week as uh, the tour, like I said, heads to Asia. Lock times will be somewhere around 11 p.m. Uh, on Wednesday night, so definitely a difference. Contest sizes are down a little bit because of that, but not too much. Um, certainly a little change. Uh, overnight golf is something uh, definitely uh, interesting to get used to, uh, but won't have to worry about sweating golf on Sunday, that's for sure, unless you want to get up in the wee hours of the morning. So until tomorrow night, everybody, uh, hope you enjoyed this uh, session and uh, look forward to hearing you back for, uh, seeing you back for tomorrow night. Thanks, everybody. Cheers.